mix 12, ground zero, with the melody guitars up 0.3, bass up 0.4, kick down 0.5, overheads up 0.4, less gate on the snare, and 3dB added a 10k on the Poltex to the rhythm guitars. We're rolling. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. All right, that's it. Dishonor. And Rish Outfield. Dishonor on you. Dishonor on your cow. Dishonor on your whole family. Hi. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. You don't get to say that. Oh, that's our word. <laughs> Go. <laughs> Una guta solo. Oh. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 100 and... 13. 13. Thank you, Oedo T. Anytime, Big Anklevich. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. And what is our story this week, Bigglesby? Funny you should ask that, Richelieu. Our story this week is The Troop. By returning veteran writer Harris Tobias. No, no, no. It's Tobias Harris. <laughs> you, should we start over? Have we started again? Interestingly enough, today's episode was produced for us by... Tobias Harris. Yeah, that is interesting. Tobias, Tobias Queen. Okay. And the lead character was performed by Harris Queen. No. Tobias, <laughs> no, the lead character was performed also by Tobias Queen. How did this happen? Luck of the Irish, of the draw, of something. Just by chance, mere chance. I knew that Tobias Queen had an amazing uh, voice for narration, and so I wanted to get him something that where he could do a little bit more than, I think actually the last time he did absolutely nothing, he wasn't allowed to do any voices because it was Voyage of the Van Leeuwen Hook, and so it was just me and you. He didn't get a chance, so this time around I made sure he got a chance to uh, do some narration. So you guys are in for a treat because this guy's got a voice like butter. And an ass like chocolate. Why must you go there every time? Why? Why must you ruin? About the author. Harris Tobias was raised by robots disguised as New Yorkers. Despite an awkward childhood, he learned to read and write. To date, Mr. Tobias has published two detective novels, The Greer Agency and A Felony of Birds, to critical acclaim. In addition, he has published short stories in Down in the Dirt magazine, Literal Translations, Electric Flash, and Ray Gun Revival. Amen. He currently lives and writes in Charlottesville, Virginia. Here it comes, The Troop, by Harris Tobias, produced by Tobias Queen, and with nothing to do with Tobias Bakel. Enjoy, folks. The Troop, by Harris Tobias. The troop eyes me with suspicion. The leader, an alpha male the size of a compact car, looks me over before deciding I'm no threat. He runs his sensing appendage over my body. I've learned to simply stand still and let him go through his little charade. God only knows what he makes of me. The slimy appendage travels up and down my leg and torso. If Alf senses anything, he senses my desperation to stay alive. I need these guys. Please, Alf, just ignore me. Alf is the head man, the big kahuna, the F.A., the king. He's not only big, he's tremendously strong. I have my sidearm, but I doubt it would be much use against him in a fight. The inspection over, Alf chitters to the others and they return to their foraging. <laughs> We've been doing this little kabuki dance for several weeks now. Alf knows me. Hell, the whole troop knows me. I've been shadowing them since we crashed on this no-name rock. I feel like some extra biological Jane Goodall following the chimps around, trying to discern their behavior. Except, 
I'm not observing these aliens to learn about their behavior. I'm hanging around them to stay alive. If anything is apparent in all this, it's that it's my behavior that's changing, not theirs. The troop represents this world's most evolved life form and my best chance for survival. They know how to survive, what foods to eat, where to find water and protection from predators. They're wonderfully adept at climbing the tall, thorny plants that pass for trees here. They know what fruits are edible and how to open their impenetrable husks. I wouldn't last a minute here on my own. They've been my salvation since the emergency rations ran out about a month ago. Has it been a month already? Huh. Time sure flies when there's no hope of rescue. No. Rescue's out of the question. My flight was off the radar. Sub Rasa. Illegal and clandestine. My crew of four killed, the radio smashed, and there never was an emergency beacon. Smugglers and pirates don't expect the cavalry to come to their rescue. It's part of the bargain we make when we enter the business. The usual end for a pirate is either a quick death from eating vacuum or forgotten in a damp cell on a prison moon somewhere. Getting stranded on an alien world? Well, <laughs> that just doesn't happen. It's an impossible long shot. <laughs> Ain't it just my luck? Shot up and disabled, running from the feds. We lost them in the dust cloud, but never gained control. Crash landing on an uncharted world is simply never heard of. I was the only survivor. The troop is moving again. I follow a few discreet yards behind. First I look around for any edibles they may have left behind. I see a few half-eaten banana quats. Well, that, that's what I call them. Long yellow fruits with a sour taste. Not my favorite, as they often give me cramps, but beggars can't be choosers. So, I put the best ones in my bag for later. The troop moves fast, and I don't dare lose them. There are some nasty critters here, and meat is meat, even if it evolved a zillion miles away. My troop seems to have a well-defined territory. In the month I've been following them, we haven't encountered any other bands. That's fine with me. I'd hate to be caught in the middle of a border war. These creatures are about twice the size of baboons, which is what they remind me of. They're social like baboons, and the troop has a similar organization. The troop is dominated by the alpha male. He has a harem with him and the alpha female at the top of the pecking order. Lesser females and young males round out the population. Counting the juveniles, there are about 25 of us. They look nothing like baboons, however. Besides being bigger, these guys have eight limbs and can change color in an instant. In that respect, they're more like terrestrial cephalopods than anything else. The color displays are rich and varied, and I'm sure if I was doing field research, it would be a major part of what I'd be studying. I've learned to read a few of their color signals. When Alf grabs a female for mating, he flashes a deep green. The female responds by alternately flashing from green to deep purple. My tattered old uniform is several shades of gray. I have no idea what gray is saying, but I'm pretty sure it's not sexual attraction. I suppose they've gotten used to me. I know I've become accustomed to them. At first I found them ugly, frightening, but we all seem to have mellowed out over time. At least Alf isn't making threat displays every time he sees me. He used to raise a couple of limbs high over his head, turn a bright red, and charge. <laughs> I would have to show submission by falling to the ground. Then, Alf would give a loud, hooting cry <laughs> and swagger back to his subjects. A few minutes later, he would do the same thing all over again. Sometimes, this went on all day long. 
I came close to shooting the old boy in the beginning, before I realized he was just showing off for the home team. I'm glad I didn't do anything hasty. Alf was only showing me who was boss. He can't help what he is. After a week or two, he settled down, got used to my presence, and went back to screwing and eating, the two activities that occupy most of his waking hours. Alf's a good guy. I don't begrudge him scoring points by making me look weak. I've taken to calling my troop the Babblers. That's what their most common vocalization sounds like to me. Babbling voices. The Babblers move from one part of their large territory to another. When we arrive at a likely spot, the subordinate males and females scurry up the thorny trees and begin throwing down fruits or nuts for the rest. The tree climbers have to go way out on the springy limbs to get the ripest fruits. It's dangerous work. Sometimes they fall and injure themselves. The older females use their strong jaws or rocks to smash open the tough outer shells to get at the inner meats. I've tried it myself with rocks and I can attest for the toughness of the nuts. When the troop moves on, I move in and hunt around for whatever scraps are left. I guess that makes me a scavenger, <laughs> or a gleaner, as I would rather think of myself. It's not a very dignified way for an advanced intelligence like myself to make a living, but uh, intelligence alone isn't going to keep me alive on this world. When my emergency supplies ran out after the first couple of weeks, and it was clear that there would be no rescue, well... A man does what he has to. I have nothing to be ashamed of. You do what you have to. The crash was a terrible thing. I was knocked unconscious by the force of it and don't remember all that much. I must have been thrown clear because when I awoke, I was 20 yards from the smoldering wreck, and the rest of the crew was dead. <laughs> the bitter irony is that this was going to be our last run. This was the big hit, the one every pirate dreams about. We'd ambushed and boarded an ore carrier in the Orion Panhandle. We rounded up her crew and locked them in the hold. We threatened to space them one at a time until they told us something we wanted to hear. After we sent the third guy to his death, the captain broke down and showed us his hidey hole. We found 63 pounds of pure tricium, the most expensive metal in the galaxy. At 20 million credits a pound, we were set for life. We spaced the rest of the crew to cover our tracks, stashed the loot aboard our ship, and let the ore carrier drift. I never said I was a nice guy. That night, we drank to celebrate our haul. We drank to the end of a glorious career. We drank to our newfound wealth. We drank ourselves into a coma. Alarms woke us. A federal ship. We fled. We dodged. We used all our tricks until we lost them in the cloud. The chase proved to be too much for our battered old cruiser. We fried the nav system, and most of the drive was shot. The captain picked the best crash site he could. This godforsaken ball. The rest, you know. Welcome to my home. The troop's third feeding yielded a half-eaten blue fruit. My favorite edible. They're big and tough like coconuts, except they're blue and taste remotely like apples. I munch on it as I follow along. Suddenly, Alf stops dead in his tracks. The troop stops too, sensing appendages erect, sniffing the air. We move ahead cautiously, and it's strangely quiet. I'm wondering what's up when there's a sudden explosion of noise directly in front of us. Out of a thicket, another troop emerges. There are considerably more of them 
than us. Their alpha male is a magnificent creature. He assumes the threat display, as does Alf. Their color changes are awesome and in perfect sync, cycling through several shades of red. Both troops begin babbling and screaming as if rooting for their side. The two alphas put on quite a show. The clash, when it came, was almost too fast to follow. One second, the two alphas were flashing at each other, and in the next, our alf was on his back. Suddenly, I was worried. How would regime change affect me? Probably not in a positive way. It had taken me weeks to be accepted by my babblers. There was no telling how long it would take a new alpha to accept my presence. What if he didn't? What would become of me then? As Jane Goodall always said, better to stick with the troop you know than to start up with a new one. Actually, I didn't care what Jane Goodall said. Her survival didn't hinge on the outcome of local disputes. Mine did. The rival Alpha appeared to be winning handily. My Alpha was on his back for a second time. His colors flashed from red to orange to yellow, while the rival's color remained several shades of red. It was time for me to step up and do something to help my team. I drew my sidearm and put six bullets into the rival male. His color display changed dramatically as he died, going from red to gray. Then, he fell over dead. Alf picked himself up off the ground with as much dignity as he could muster and examined his opponent. Alf poked at him with an appendage before flashing his victory display. I swear, he looked like a boxing champ who just scored a knockout, both arms raised in victory. I'm not sure the troop as a whole understood what had happened, but I suspect old Alf did. The dynamics of the troop changed almost immediately. I've been eating better for one thing. Alf makes certain that there's food left behind for me, and not half-eaten leftover food either, but whole, fresh, untouched food. He's assigned a female to me as well. At least I think that's what's going on. She's one of the lower-ranked juveniles. I call her Jane. She gives me green flashes when she looks my way. I'm not sure what she's saying yet, but uh, I find it sweet. I'm not quite ready for a relationship just yet, but uh, hey, in a few months, who knows? Huh. It's not quite the life I had in mind. Me and my mates were supposed to be living the high life back on Terra about now. Unfortunately, they're all dead, and I'm alive. There's a moral in all this somewhere, but... I don't have the luxury to think about it. My troop is packing up and moving on. Jane is lagging behind, making sure I'm all right. I see a nice pile of nuts left behind. I scoop them up and put them in my bag. I give Alf a call of thanks and follow. And now, a word about today's story. This is a story about uh, alienation and acceptance, uh, about being an outsider and then gaining the trust of the group you wish to join. At first, the protagonist is a threat and then an annoyance, and then eventually he uh, survives just by eating cast-offs from the group until he wins them over by saving the leader. And that changes everything, and he manages to be accepted and even find some hope for a better life. I had the vague notion of just a stranded spaceman trying to survive in an alien world. It was only when I started writing the story that I realized that the themes were much bigger than just just the narrative. I was dealing with the universal ideas of alienation and acceptance. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the story. I know I did. It's been a long time since I said that. I know I did. <laughs> Not long enough. I enjoyed the uh, the bongo drums. Yeah. 
You like the mood setting bongo drums? I, I, it seems like somebody complained about us using bongo drums in a previous episode. Oh, I, what's the one with the Neanderthals? It's like Neanderthals didn't play bongo drums. I personally played no, snare drums. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I don't they, know. They were part of the Dave Brubeck Seven, and I don't remember thing what their complaint was, but it wasn't technically accurate because Neanderthal music was a lot more sophisticated than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I liked it. I liked the uh, mood setting uh, music that we had where it would be the and it would give you the idea of where you're at, too, because it was kind of a long narration that just kind of went and meandered from this to that. It gave you a good idea as to what your setting was when you're in, back in the memories of the spaceship. It goes back to that sad, morose do 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 music singing again. And uh, then when we're back on the planet. Back to the bongos. Um, you know, I guess we could do a quick uh, cast list. There's not really much cast to this story. It was a one-man band. And uh, then, Wait, why would we need to do a cast I list? I guess we don't need to, so no. you can cut that part out. No, let's hear it. Let's hear the cast list. you got to be going somewhere with this. No, I was just going to say Tobias Queen. We always do the cast list right after we get back, and we didn't do it. But I guess we don't No, no, no. After the to. story is the feedback, not oh. the cast list. Oh, okay. After the story, the cast list. There See, you there go. you go. I told you. It was always after the story. That was mean. I don't want to read that. That's mean. Was there anything other than Tobias? Because, like, where did the alien language and the grunting and all that come from? It was Tobias. Um, he, he just kept the mic on all the time. And one time he stubbed his toe. And he just took that grunting and screaming and anger sounds and slow mowed them down a little bit. So they sounded deeper and more alien. Do you think that there's anybody on Earth tough enough to that it wouldn't bother them if they stubbed their toe because i used to think about that and i'd be like i'll bet arnold schwarzenegger he stubs his toe he's like ah maria oh that so much i don't know what the deal is do we have just a ton of extra nerves right <laughs> there that you can't build up an immunity to because yeah i'll stub my toe as an adult male and it hurts as bad as anything did when i was four years old yeah maybe maybe there are some people that just you know their feet are numb maybe that person doesn't <laughs> scream like a little girl when he stubs you his mean toe. like a paraplegic is that kind of where we're well, going not, with this? not a paraplegic but you know just like somebody where there, there's got to be some kind of nerve damage or something in their foot or maybe so that they don't actually feel you know like kick ass who has his nerves all messed up so that he doesn't feel pain like a normal person he stubs his toe doesn't hurt so bad he doesn't scream because his nerves don't work so he doesn't get the pain but then I, I would imagine when when he plows that really hot chick in the third act of the Kick-Ass, he shouldn't be able to feel that either, right? I don't know. That would be a bit of a bummer. Well, I, would you be able to plow a hot chick if you couldn't feel it to begin with? Well, that's a good question. Let's ask an uh, announcer man. Announcer don't man. go there. Oh, sorry. Well, are the play, pain centers of your brain... And the pleasure centers of your brain in different places? Is it your brain where the centers come from? Did he have some kind of spinal damage? Jalupa for you, Rish. And that's why he couldn't feel pain? I think it all comes from your nerves. I had to get a filling the other day. And I swear, I don't know what the dentist was doing. I don't know if this happens to you whenever you get a filling. It was in. more than a filling. <laughs> yes. A pun. Um, the lowest form of humor. <laughs> uh, right you are, announcer man. That That's definitely the case. But anyways, hurts, man. I, so I was getting a filling and like the dentist is, you know, they put on that stuff so that you can't feel it when they first stick you in. It's the topical anesthesia. They don't anesthesia. usually use a boot. And then they just jams that freaking needle in there and I'm sitting there going, Arr! and he's moving it around and moving it around. Like the joystick. And moving it around and moving it. And he keeps moving it. I'm like, dude, this guy's just not going to stop until he jabs right on the nerve. Does that ever happen to you where the dentist is giving you the shot and they jab it right on the nerve of your mouth and all of a sudden, zoing, it, it gets you right and, you know, it gives you that zing. Yeah, that. It gives you that feeling uh, where it just, just shoots right up in there and it's just, ow, there's no, you know. And he did that, yeah. He, he kept moving around and moving around until, wham, he hit right on the nerve and... And you saw your Marianne walking away. I did. I'll be here all, fo all, all folks week. Oh, nice. Keep, keep on serving up puns, the lowest form of humor. Hey, oh. that last part wasn't it. Oh, yeah, I suppose. Um, so anyways, uh, yeah, 
and, it, and it's interesting too, the whole numb thing. When the numb gets all over your mouth and then you finish with the filling, you walk away, you go on through your day and you can't feel your face still for like half the day before it finally comes back. And on the way out of the dentist, I thought, okay, I'm not going to want to eat anything because if I do, I'll chew up half my lip and, I, and it won't be good. So I figured I'll just get like a soda and at least I'll be able to drink something and it'll taste good and it'll be kind of nice in the interim. Uh But a soda is cold. It is cold. Oh, see, your story is so predictable. Uh, It is cold, but that wasn't the problem because I couldn't feel anything. So the cold didn't bother me. But the problem was it's more than just being numb. Like not just the pain was numb, but my taste buds were numb. I couldn't taste it. I poured that soda in and I was like... And all the spots that were numb on the one side, I couldn't taste anything. I could only taste on the other side where it wasn't numb. And I just thought, that sucks. This doesn't work at all. This doesn't help. And so I had to. I went and put my soda in the fridge and had to wait until I actually thawed out and my face could feel again before I could bother to even drink it. So going back to your question, which was something about... What is our story to Your nerve centers and something about that i don't remember what your question was anymore that i was trying to answer but our pain and pleasure in the same oh there we go i knew it was something so yeah it might be in the same place because yeah the nerves you know when it numbed my pain it numbed my taste buds too so i don't know this story doesn't have anything to do with the story though this stubbing your toe tangent but that's okay we do that a lot ah maria it has so much <laughs> i'm sorry about the housekeeper okay all right well back to the story about back to harris tobias harris queen <laughs> is it true that we rejected this story and then unrejected it sort of um what happened was uh nicole who was our uh submissions editor she got that story in and she looked at it and she said this is a good story I like it a lot, but there's only one person in this story. And Big and Rish always want me to make sure that there's a part for both of them. And so she said, well, this is a good story, but we're going to have to reject it. And she sent the guy a rejection letter and everything. And then later she thought, yeah, maybe I should ask. Because I think she got another story that was the same kind of thing, where it was uh, all girls or something like that. All girls all the time. And uh, that story's coming up, it turns out. And so she said, you know what, maybe I better check and see if they're willing to look at these stories. And so she said, are you guys willing? And I said, hey, most important thing is that it's a good story. And so I had her send them out to me. And you said, you know me, I'm always willing. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I read it through. And I thought, you know, this is a good story. I think we need to do it. And I sent it to you and you agreed. So we broke our cardinal rule. I don't know if that's really a cardinal rule, but we decided that we would do a story with just one person. We had a cardinal rule. We mentioned it like the first season. Wait, do we not have a season? (laughs) We we mentioned it the first year, though. If you want to sell us a story, it has to be. And I can't remember. I I guess fun was probably our first rule. Yeah, I think a good story. Uh, And then the second rule was that it had to work well in audio. I remember. Uh But yeah, probably we would lean toward... A story with more than one character that has dialogue, that, but that that goes along with works well in audio. Yeah, we're a two-person team. And don't uh, forget, announcer man. Okay, well we're two and a half person team. And what about me, R zero eight zero T? Stop it! You're not even a person, O eight O T. Come on. That really hurts. You know well, what really it's... hurts? Stubbing your toe. Yeah. Something yeah. you'll never have to experience. We we we're two people. And so we lean towards stories where there's more than one character or at least, you know, a character and a narrator right? and all that. But we're willing to make an exception on a story like this that, yeah, I, I remember when I read it thinking, oh, geez, there's not really any part for big in this story. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's not really any a, a, a part for a second person. And, and so, you know, you take a step back and you have to make a decision. There have been stories that we've rejected because we didn't think they would work well in audio. Uh, and there have been stories that we've rejected because, you know, just the, the, the structure of the story, I guess that goes along with make it doesn't work well in audio. But it did, the structure of the story makes it kind of impossible for us to 
produce it satisfactorily. I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is sometimes there's something that works to the eye, but doesn't work to the ear. Mm -hmm. And maybe poetry is the opposite of that. Poetry is meant to be read aloud, or at least I can't get the same thing out of poetry, at least rhyming couplet poetry, when I just read it on a page, right. as when I read it aloud and, you know, there's a cadence and a rhythm to it. I don't know, because there, there have been stories that people have sent to us that have, like, diagrams in them and, you know... Well, there was that one story that we mentioned a little while ago where there were songs and stuff that were part of the story and we would have had to compose the song and put it all together and we just thought, oh, this is more than we can handle for an audio production. And so we decided to pass on it. And that that's kind of one of those things where yeah, it just wasn't going to work in audio. Or I guess maybe it could have worked in audio had we had oodles and oodles of time to do it. And you know what? Maybe they've sent that to someone else who loved the story and was willing to put the time that would be necessary into it. And if so, yeah, I'd be happy to plug that podcast or that show or yeah. whatever it is. It just that story needed to go to Norm Sherman because that guy composes a lot of music anyway. Yeah, right? he's a music guy. And, and and another thing that that I've told you for years is sometimes I'll have an idea for a story, but it's a movie. It won't work as a short story. It would only work as a screenplay or as a short film. And that, and trying to adapt something from like a script form to a short story form, sometimes it just doesn't work. Right. I don't know how we're on this. Because this story is uh, is unusual for what we would normally do. We had no part in this whatsoever. I know. Isn't that the weird thing? Tobias did this whole thing by himself. And, you know, he's got a great voice and it sounds awesome. And I loved to listen to it. It was really... Uh, it's one of those things where it's kind of like the first time we had Renee Chambliss on doing a, a story for us. And you hear her voice and you're just like, wow, this sounds too good to be on our show. And uh, Tobias is the same kind of thing. He's got that voice that's like butter. It just sounds so professional and amazing that we had to give him a chance to do that. And it seemed like the perfect story to do it. We can just let him loose and set him free and say, go for it. And... Yeah, he turned us back this this great production. And the story was one of those stories, like we were saying. We, we looked at it and said, no, oh, it's just one part. And it's just a... But we liked it enough that we said, you know what? Screw it. It doesn't have to be that way. We can go for it. And so, uh, yeah, there you have it. Does Tobias Queen... It's so crazy that I have to, to differentiate when I'm using that name. Decide which Tobias you're referring uh, to. Does Mr. Queen have his own podcast because i mean he sounds like a professional or he sounds like he does that all the time well he's uh, becoming a professional uh for that matter he incidentally started his own audiobook publishing company you don't say well it's it's coming soon anyways i know that for a long time uh since the last time he did van leeuwenhoek and that was like february or march or something when when we did that episode i think and uh afterward he said oh i'm gonna have to take some time off because i just got the opportunity to read an audiobook for somebody and some somebody who was an author was getting their book done and he uh, managed to win that contract or whatever the heck you do and so he was go going to uh Absolutely. read that out that's read rad that out. wouldn't that be a great job it man? would be really cool and so uh he says that uh, he's working on it, and it's, and it's. I guess he hasn't decided on the title because he's got here a list of domain names that he bought that he just might use just in case. And they are yourbookoutloud.com, yourworkoutloud.com, mybookoutloud.com, myworkoutloud.com. I guess he'll decide on one of those, <laughs> and uh, we'll be hearing uh, hopefully some more from somethingoutloud.com. Oh, that's weird. So do you think, because one of the options is your and one of the options is my, people can just send him their novel along with a check for 850 and he records the whole darn thing and then puts it out as an audiobook? I think it's something like that, yeah, where he's doing audiobooks for others. Well, that's a cool idea. I wish him luck with it. But not too much luck, because I would like him to produce another story for us. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so other Tobias. Harris Tobias. He wrote 
the alarm. That's right. For us, and it was the one with the the dragon. Right. The dragon the chained to a bell. Bell that suddenly starts ringing, and the people in the village need to decide what the heck they're going to do. Was that the only other Harris Tobias story we've done? That's the only one we've had so far. Okay. I wouldn't Wait, you su- say so far. Do you know something I don't know? No, not yet. But I wouldn't be surprised that in the future we get some more great stories from Harris because I, I don't know if we've turned him down or not. Perhaps there's other stories like this one where uh, Nicole looked at it and said, yeah, nah, and we never even saw it. I don't know. I don't remember ever uh, rejecting a story of his, but maybe we have. But I bet in the future, he writes good stuff. I bet we'll get some more stories by Harris Tobias, because so far I've liked uh, both of the stories that we've gotten from him. They're good stuff. So uh, I'm hoping he'll send us some more good stuff to do. Well, if you're a writer and you have Tobias as part of your name, (laughs) submissions at dunesteef.com. That's right. Make sure you read those submission guidelines before then. That is important because... uh, That email address has certain things that must be done to it for Nicole to even receive your email. So do read the submission guidelines. You may find that no one ever even knows that you sent us a story. Crazy. I'll bet it's been six months since I've given the, if you want to send us a submission thing. Yeah. Probably the Alcarm was the last episode when we did that. (laughs) But yeah, another interesting thing too is uh, the art for this episode, Tobias Queen... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, see what he did there. Put it, he put it together for us. He talked to this guy. Apparently, his name is Christian Leon, who is an artist, and he uh, worked out a deal and got us the uh, awesome art that we've got um, for this episode. I really liked it, and uh, we've got a link for this artist. You can go and check out his site and see his stuff. Did you really say that? Um, <laughs> be cool if we could get more stuff from him in the future too. Yeah, I really liked the episode art. I wish we had episode art for every episode. Um, recently, I saw that Drabblecast has gone back to all the episodes that they don't have art for and commissioned art for it. Uh, gosh, I'd like to be able to do that. And we've talked about that in the past. Like, okay, I'm going to do art for stories from our first year. And, and I never do because there are stories that we're doing for right now. Right. And it just it, it's work. There's too many things to do. But yeah, that's definitely an ambition that, uh, that we had to uh, go back and make sure that there's art. Yeah, for cool. all the old episodes that never got any. I don't know how hard that would be, how much time it would take, but it would it would be cool to do. Well, we never talked about it because you did the episode art for uh, all the cool monsters at once after we'd recorded our episode. But you slaved over that <laughs> one. If you uh, just listen to the show on iTunes or something and you don't have a way of seeing that art, he took a bunch of the monsters, a a photo. He he searched for a photo of all these monsters and then he made a collage of all of the monsters. And then he put the title and author and our logo and Creative Commons, the entire contract text (laughs) over the image so you couldn't see any of the monsters. But uh, yeah, you... You spent a ton of time on that. I did spend more time than I meant to spend on it, for sure. I think it took me several hours to get all that put together. You know, I I, I couldn't just put one monster on when the title of the story was all the cool monsters at once. I had to put several on, so. That's funny, though, because I sent you a picture of Ogo Pogo, and it's like, this is our episode art, (laughs) and you had already done yours, and so it would have just been one monster. Which would have been a good one at least to pick. It started with Ogopogo, if I remember, was the first line of the uh, story. But uh, but yeah, I, I think that's fun. Art is a, a fun thing to throw together. If you're an artist and you'd like to uh, do that, we've got all sorts. You could go through and just pick a story. If there's one in our back catalog that you'd like to uh, do art for, you could just send it along and audition with that. And say, hey, here's one that you could use for this or that or whatever. That's a cool idea. Hey, I'm glad you phrased it that way because I was too meek to ask people to send in episode art and <laughs> volunteer. That's that's a good job. But yeah, we'd love to have cool episode art for each one. And, you know, I try to make sure that it's attached to the MP3 file every time so that when you play it in your iPod or play it on your iTunes or whatever, you actually see the artwork when the uh, story comes up and plays. So... People that get the story from iTunes can see that hand in the jungle right now. They do, yeah. They should be able to see it. 
That's really cool. As okay, long so as I, their I, screen I... hasn't gone on sleep on them and they can't see it or they're jogging. Yeah, Caroline and uh, Bria can't see it because, you know, their iPod's in their pocket right now or whatever. Maybe they got it. Have you ever seen those things where they strap it to their arm? Maybe they can still. Yeah, lethal injection. Bring I it over and look. Cool. Oh, is that what that is? That is a lot like running. There's a similarity to that. <laughs> I don't know necessarily about lethal injection, but I do know I'm running. Very, very painful, yes. Uh, yeah, and if you've ever seen me run, they both have the exact same final product. Yeah. Or final destination to do that joke yeah, again. The same result. There you go. It's just along the lines of this conversation. There's so many areas that you could work on or focus on or hire somebody. If, if this were a professional show, you'd have somebody whose job it was to do the episode art and you'd have somebody whose job it was to do the music and there's somebody whose job it was to do the sound effects and the, the editing of the story and the editing of our bullshit. And <laughs> uh, because it's, it's us. And don't forget, announcer man. Right, an announcer man. And me too. Oh, for the love of <laughs> Thor, stop it. Um, because it's just us, we sort of have to juggle all that and make a determination wh where our focus is going to be. And, you know, if, if it had been up to me or if I were more musically talented, I would have come up with a Dune Steve theme and a Ducine Steve going home theme and a October Scary Story theme and a Broken Mirror theme and all these, these songs and stuff like that. But I don't have talent <laughs> in that area, as announcer man constantly reminds me. But somebody wrote a Dune Steve song <laughs> for us recently and they sent it to us. And I meant to mention it on the show before because it was awesome. The day that that came, I was really bummed out. I, I, I had hoped to get a job and it looked like I wasn't going to get that job. And I was just feeling sorry for myself and big sent this. You'll never guess what somebody sent us link. And I listened to it and it just it made me feel loved yeah it definitely did I, I had the same uh, reaction to it i heard that and i swear i was i had teared up as i listened to this song it was so cool did you really cry i, I didn't cry as it were but I, I teared up man i had like watery eyes to get something that's so heartfelt and so, hey, guys, I really, you know, I mean, it's one thing to get donations, which is really cool. And it really means something because this is money. This is something you could use for. For what do they call this thing? To prevent me from popping my peas? Pop filters. You had to get a pop filter and to pay Harris Tobias. Or you could keep that money yourself, not donate it and go out and buy a candy bar. Right. <laughs> so, see, I don't know. I have no money, so I'm not sure what you would do with money if you had But, it. yeah, I mean, that's something that uh, you could keep and spend on yourself. And so that's something. But it's also fairly easy to get money and give it away and spend it on crap that you don't need, et cetera, et cetera. But sitting down and writing a song and performing the song enough times that you got it down and then recording yourself performing the song... There's just something really cool and special, and I don't know what it was about it, but it, 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 I don't know. It just really uh, meant something, meant a lot to me to, to, to get that. You know what would be, really be cruel is if we never played the song or said the name of the person who sent us the song. Yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. Um, Good night, folks. We actually, <laughs> we actually have the song, and we're going to play it for everybody to hear. Uh, Melissa Hills sent us this song. And, uh, yeah, she just calls it a Dune Steve Diddy. I don't know if it has a uh, official title, but uh, here you go. It's uh, it's played on the ukulele, and, and it's got some, some pretty good lyrics to it. Check it out and enjoy yourself. I Okay, thanks. I am known to enjoy myself. I was talking to the listeners. Okay, well, you got to specify, man. I'm...
authors whose stories are all on Doomsday, who knows what it means Doomsday, it's an audio fiction Okay, so what'd you guys think? Good stuff? Yay? Nay? I loved it. I I think we're too close to it. <laughs> That's possible. No, I, you know, I don't know. I, I can't play a musical instrument. I can whistle. Would that count? No! It's kind of like playing a horn in a way, right? <laughs> a kazoo is more of a, playing a musical instrument than a whistle, and it doesn't take any talent to play a kazoo. But there's not. Not everybody can whistle, though. I mean, that's... Takes a okay, we'll whistle the the whistle scorpions. Dixie. Twins have changed to me then. Okay. All right, now sing the entire Winds of Change song. <laughs> I don't know all the words, and I, I don't know if I could get that good German accent to my song. Well, see, I thought they were Russian. No, they're Because they mention, they, they mention... Gorky Park. Right. Follow the most down to Gorky Park. Listen to the winds of change. Yeah, they're German. You sure? Yes. You bet. Klaus Meina is the name of that goofy, bald, long-haired singer they've got. Wait, how can he be bald and long hair? He has hair on the sides that he actually let grow long. Isn't that awful? Because you had to have long hair in a hair band. His name is Klaus Meina. Klaus Meina. And they have lots of names like that. One of them is named like Rudolf Schenker. <laughs> These are cool names. Yeah. Uh, just be lucky your wife doesn't call out Klaus Meine in the middle of the night because that's a <laughs> name that you would call out. <clears throat> <laughs> so, anyways, I don't it's know. It's funny. Okay, because we're off track a, here. Announcer man didn't interrupt us for singing, and two, he didn't mention that we had derailed. Yeah, he's a so big, he's just not done his job. He's a big fan of Scorpions, so that's why. Oh well, here I am. Rock me like a hurricane. <clears throat> Rock you like a hurricane. Oh, thank you, announcer man. Well, I, I just figured, you know, you, you rocked me like a hurricane with your rendition of Winds of Change. <laughs> and now a word from our sponsors. Wait, a sponsor pays you, right? Yeah, I don't think we've ever so had a sponsor, really. This is wait, wait, a wait. word from our? We had that sponsor one time. Kevin Anderson was our sponsor. Remember that? I do, yeah. That we, was a long time ago. It was the... It was for his audio website. Audio something market. Audio, audio fiction and magazine. Uh, no, that's us. Uh, <laughs> audio market list, I think is what it was that's called. That's right. That was cool. So what yeah, what do we, what do we call a non sponsor? Fiend of the show. <laughs> there we go. Well, I guess when it really comes down to it, we're plugging ourselves though, because I mean we're talking not too long ago, pseudopod sent us over an email asking if I would read a story for them. And I said, oh, hell no. And then they kicked me in the nuts. And I said, I'm sorry. I meant yes. Inconceivable. And uh, so, yeah, I read a story that uh, I think it's just coming up on their site uh, this week, if it's, if it's not up already. The story is called Killing Merwin Remus. It's an interesting little tale. Do you remember who wrote it? It was by Jason Helmendaller. You just made that artist up there ain't no writer like that no it turns out that there really is it, it could very well be a pseudonym for all i know but that's who the author professes himself to be so if you'd like to hear that story swing on over to pseudopod.org and uh, check it out you saying you changed your name to hellman dollar yeah it used to be mayonnaise anus <laughs> Used to be mayonnaise buck. It used to be buck mayonnaise. Wait, wait, Hellman's mustard, huh? Used to be buck mustard. Mister, okay, quit while I'm ahead. Yeah, please. So uh, that's a horror story. It is uh, horrific. I can't remember what. What was the deal? Is that the one where the upstairs neighbor? Yeah. You you decide it would be better if he was no longer your upstairs neighbor. That's right. 
the man can't take it anymore and he's going to kill his neighbor Merlin Remus. It's kind of a very Poe-esque, kind of a telltale heart kind of a story. It's along those lines. So yeah, check it out. And uh, speaking of giving a plug for our, ourselves, uh, didn't you have something on a, on a show too? Well, sort of. Uh, there was a contest, and I, I think I mentioned it when they first announced the contest, that it was one of those where I was super excited when they announced it. <sighs> and then I found out that the deadline was like a hundred days in the future. It was like three and a half months later. And I do that, remember you And saying instantly that. the air went out of my balloon and I just like... Oh. And out of your anus, sadly enough. It stank for weeks. <laughs> well, I went to Derwiner Schnitzel today. Oh. And every day. Oh. So I, I did end up actually writing the story. I don't know how much time we have, but it was... The fun of this contest was... I'm sorry, we don't have time. Well, it's over at HorrorAddicts.net. Thanks. Okay. Well, it looks like we've got a few more minutes. Go oh, ahead. Oh, okay. So basically they were having a contest about horror stories about phobias. And I was like, well, that sounds cool. Uh, sign me up. And basically everybody who signed up was assigned a phobia uh -huh. that their story had to be about, was assigned a location, and then was assigned a pastime or, or uh, an activity. Oh, okay. And so I was assigned uh, entomophobia. Which is? Uh, I believe the fear of wicker furniture. Oh, nice. No, no, it, it's the fear of insects. I can see a wicker furniture fear story being real good. <laughs> like everywhere in the warehouse, he could sense it. And then the location was luau, and the activity was hang gliding. I think that's how it was. And so I had to make up a story that Getting featured those three. Included all those things. And it was also supposed to be a horror story. So it wasn't easy, but of the like 18 of us that signed up to do it, there were only like nine people that actually Achieved. entered the contest. And we sent in our stories and then we were asked to do audio versions of the stories. And the audio versions are up there right now. I think it's uh, www.horror addicts.net one word or is it horror-addicts.net can you hover uh, oh. hover julie hoverson oh one word horror addicts one word dot net but one word is not part of the uh url right <laughs> Let's do that. That's because I think that would be four words. There you go. Yes, and there, oh, of course. Oh. Yes, he made the fatal mistake of going to that site while we were sitting here. And <laughs> That's one of those lovely sites that has audio that starts right up for you. Boy, do I love that. And, of course, uh, like we always do, there will be a link in the show notes. Oh, so right. If you want to get to this website, which is one word but not really one word just click the link save yourself the effort yeah and, and and as far as i know on that the webmaster doesn't decide whose story is the best which i just assumed that they would have judges like we do or they would have slush readers or whatever i think it's you're supposed to vote for the story oh, yeah? you liked best well then you need to plug it so you can get more votes and win well if people want to listen to the story that's great and if they like my story more than the others and want to vote for it, that's great. But I just, yeah, it, it just seems like it would be fun. It's, it's, it's not at all like what we do with the Broken Mirror stories, but it is a themed writing contest. And, and if they have another theme next year, probably I'll enter it then too. It just, I find that it's, it's not easier, but it, there's some kind of advantage when somebody gives you the premise and goes for it. It's because there's nothing scarier, right, than the blank page. <laughs> That's what they always say. I, I, I mean, except for maybe like being stuck in an elevator with like the head of the Justin Bieber fan club or something like that. Oh. But, uh, you know, I, I do. I really like contests. A few months ago, we had somebody that would always update us and say, hey, there's a new contest over here. And, that, and I wish that that person were still around because... I, I liked that. I liked looking at the premise and saying, oh, I could come up with a story for that. Yeah. That's neat. I liked that person, too. I did, too. But, uh, you know, but, she yeah. pissed off Clone Pod one time, too. Oh, yeah. oh wait, that's us. <laughs> it also seems like there's something else we're here to plug. Oh, you, you know, know, there was one other thing. There's this guy... Nick Carter. Perhaps you've he heard of him. He was one of the Jonas Brothers? No, no, they would all be last name. They would be Jonas, Jonas, yeah. Well, he was an in sync guy. He might have been. 
That really does sound like an NSYNC guy's name or, <laughs> a, or, a, or a Backstreet Boy or something. Yeah, oh, that's right. He was a... a Wasn't there a bl- the blonde Backstreet Boy or something like that? Was Nick something? So anyways, I'm this sure Backstreet Boy guy, he's given up his singing career and he's decided to become a story writer. And he also is a listener of the show. Well, that's cool because I'm a listener of I Want It That Way. There you go. So <laughs> he's publishing his first ever novelette. Okay. Th- that's like a, a very short novel. Right. It's kind of like a mini novel. And uh, he's publishing it, uh, e-publishing it through uh, Vagabond Press and through Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and all that. And he was just asking us if we'd get the word out about it. So the story is called Jam Don't Shake. And uh, basically, it's about this town where there's this jam that has come out. Anti-good times, jams and jellies. And basically, this sinister product gets everybody addicted. And you're fine when you're on it, but then when it runs out... You turn into basically a, a raving lunatic zombie type thing. You, you still know what's going on, but you're so desperate for this jam and jelly that you'll do anything. And so in this town, the factory for the jam and jelly burns down and hilarity ensues. Wait, not hilarity. What's the word I'm looking for? Chaos. Ah, there we go. Yes, chaos ensues. And it's about a guy who's uh, in this town who's addicted to this jam and he's trying to uh, weather the storm. And uh, yeah, you can check it out. I think he, he survives by eating, you know, just one spoonful a day to keep himself from going over the edge. But supplies are running. Supplies are limited. Order so, today. Yeah. Well, that sounds out. like a story that's pretty much up my alley. I, yeah. I like that idea. I haven't read it and you haven't read it, right? Right. But I guess Nicholas likes us. And so we'll plug that story. Tell me again what the name of the story is. The story is called Jam Don't Shake. Uh, Ironically, I think that was a 98 Degrees song. (laughs) There you go. Jessica Simpson guessed it on that one. Yeah, I do recall. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Where can you find that? So you can, we've got a, a link to it. It's available through the Vagabond Press website plus... You can find it also on Amazon and, and Barnes and & Noble and stuff. It's it's an ebook, so you can get it on your e-reader. Cool, and I'm sure he'll send us a free copy. Of course he will. Well, that's neat. So we had three <laughs> plugs in a row, and, and, I, and it didn't kill us. You forgot about your hair plugs, too. God, damn, do, they, do these really look like doll hair? I, I think they look very natural. Is this really what you guys want to be talking about tonight? Because that sure sucked. Uh, On that note, I think I'm going to go bury my head in the sand and let people alone for another 10 days to two weeks. (laughs) How often are we getting episodes out nowadays? How about that? Yeah, that sounds about right. It depends. Whenever we're ready. Okay. Well, hey, so are we doing anything special for Halloween? For the month of Halloween? Of course. Are we just going to sing the Elfman song? <laughs> As always, we do scary stories on uh, in October. So we will be having uh, scary stories in October for you to listen to. Are we going to do a scary story event? Or are we even going to bother? Uh, Last I, time I, around, we got like... I wasn't going to bother. Did, should, can I tell people what happened? Sure, if you want to. We had a winner of the October Scary Story event. And that person had already sold that story to another podcast. <laughs> And so they ran it, and we didn't, and that pretty much soured us on the whole experience. Yeah, a little bit. It's kind of a bummer, that whole thing. I don't know. I mean, we, we're still going to do a scary story. We're going to write our own scary story during the month of October, so there's that. Yeah. There, there so if you want to be a part of that, maybe we can just have people could put their scary stories up on the forum that people could read it. or they could say my scary story's done and let me know if you want to read it and I'll send it to you or something like that so we could still share them around a little bit but I don't think we're going to do an official scary story event no I don't think so and, and yeah there weren't a tremendous amount of people that wanted to do it last year it seems like it's tapering off I guess it's time to let it die unless like everybody's saying hell no please let's do it maybe let us know, and maybe we'll change our mind, I guess. I don't it's know. It's probably not too late for us to change our mind. Depends on when this episode hits. If it comes out 10 days or two weeks. 
right. from the last one. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll just leave you with that. I mean, it could be October by the time people yeah. are hearing this. I hope it isn't, but, you know, life, life finds, finds a way. way. Running. Screaming. So we've reached the end of our episode. Thank you, Tobiases. <laughs> That's right, for producing and writing today's episode. <laughs> The Flying Tobias Brothers. And thank you, Melissa. Thank you to the listeners who have listened all the way to the end. People who've donated and, you know, who've, who've made us feel like this is worth doing again and again. Yeah. Thanks for being there for us. Hope you enjoyed the show. So see, now I want to sing. It's funny. No more singing, Rish. All right. Good night. <laughs> see you later. No, oh, this is much better. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. You may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. Are we still recording? Yeah, I think so. Can we start it again? Okay. Sit on my face and tell me that you love me. I'll sit in your face no, and tell you. you I love you too. You, sir, are a douchebag. Uh, your turn. Funny you should ask that, Richelieu. Our story this week. You farted, didn't you? It stinks. I always fart. <sighs> I knew that Tobias Queen had an amazing Schlong. narration voice. And so... Sorry, do you want to start over? <laughs> it says Mr. Tobias, and yet Tobias is his first name. Oh, no. <laughs> Tobias Queen is first name Tobias. This is Harris Tobias, which you always say. No, I think it's Tobias Harris. It is. Harris <laughs> is a last name. Tobias is a first name. I know. Name. It's a pseudonym. It must be. It's Melissa. I think it's just Hill. Melissa Hills. And she's from I FNB called her something Belgium. Wrong. You're kidding. It's where French fries come from. Fiction. Market. Market. Your market list. That's what it was. It still says Luke Coddington and Kendall Marchman. Oh, Both of them dead and in hell. Fuck it. Clone pod. Let's get Cass Macabre on. It's at least that updated. Barry J. Northern. She got Knight of the Living Trekkies on the bloody side. It's an interesting little tale. Do you remember who wrote it? No. Oh, but well then forget I asked. I could click over here and see, but... Kelling Marvin, Marvin, Marvin. Messy Mervin. You just shot Marvin in the face. Well, I liked Marvin. Jason Helmendaler. That's it, Helmendaler. It made me feel loved. Yeah, it definitely did. I, I had the same uh, reaction to it. I heard that and I swear I was, I had teared up as I listened to this song. It was so cool to hear. Are we going to play this now, by the Is, way? She said we could, right? Yes, but you were talking about an anniversary episode, etc. Well, we never did an anniversary episode. Well, that doesn't mean you didn't have it in plans. We, the anniversary was months ago, as I said back in the first place. I know. It, well, but you would constantly mention that it was months ago. So it was just like, okay, somebody tells you you're fat enough times you <laughs> take up jogging or you okay. stop sleeping with them. So, so we want to play it now then? Can we? Yeah. One thing I was going to say about the story was just the concept of aliens. And so often aliens are just the big headed big-eyed things or they look just like us and 
you know, if a species actually evolved on a different planet with a different atmosphere, with different vegetation and all that stuff, well, I mean, would we even recognize it as life? It would, it could be so very, very different. And, mm-hmm. and, and would we, like in this story where he's able to eat the same fruit that they eat and he says meat is meat, you know, not necessarily is meat and meat. You eat things that you think are meat and then you die because you can't digest it. There is nothing we won't try. Never heard the word impossible this time. There's no stopping us. Cut it out.